Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we uh, are in the middle of summer, as you can tell. <laughs> and uh, I know where almost everybody that's not here is, but they're off doing summer stuff. And uh, I got tickled at Francisco last week uh, because he was going there going to look at some property around the brothel somewhere. Uh, he had said, well, you know, when it says access to our water available, what does that mean? I said, well, a lot of different things. <laughs> So uh, anyway, we're here. I don't. Uh, just the only announcement I have is we were able to put together all of the bucket money and the donations that we received, and sent. We haven't actually mailed the check yet, but sent a check to Champions Kids Camp for five thousand dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's uh, so. That's ten kids that we will have sponsored, and uh, like I said before, they already had camp, but now the bills are coming in, so it'll be fine. Um, and I'm thinking about how to figure out how to, I told, talked to Bill about it the other day, maybe we may just decide to do the concert inside, but we may do it during the pumpkin patch time in October when that might help us get some people here for those first two weeks of pumpkins. We don't sell a lot, you know, it's the last two weeks, but uh, anyway, something like guy across the street has a food truck now, so we may get him to come over there, you know, anything to liven it up a little bit. Um, so uh, Francisco's not here. Chris is still in the hospital. Chris is not in the hospital, but he's home. I told you all the story about COVID, right? That he can't get his PT and other stuff. And uh, so Leslie volunteered to come and help us tonight. And uh, so I don't really know how that's going to work out. He's going to be fine. <laughs> the rest of us really need to help him. <laughs> so uh, so we're, we need to sing, don't we, Leslie? So he's got one new tune that we haven't done before, but it's, it's kind of catchy. I think we'll have some fun with it. So uh, why don't we go ahead and watch the video and we'll get started. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. Church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God, and we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts, and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but he is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Okay, welcome everybody. As you're able, would you stand as we sing How Great Is Our God? I think we all know that. And of course, it's going to sound a little different on the piano, but we'll work it out.
All right, so I don't know this one, and y'all aren't either, but he's going to teach it to us. I'm going to crank his mic up just a little bit. Uh, I'll leave. Well, yeah, this is really easy, and it's cool. I think we're going to figure it out. And we'll sing the first verse twice. Okay. Just, I'll sing it once, and then I'll let you join me. There we go. Again, I think sometimes that, that God can use me anywhere, anytime. I like that. Amen. Uh, so, let's pray. Gracious God, we uh, come to this place where it's safe, but we live in a world that's not safe. We hear horror stories every day about violence, fear. But God, you called us to be different, to be peaceful, peacekeepers in your kingdom. So today we do pray for our friend Francisco and Deborah as they travel for traveling mercies that they be safe. We pray for Chris and Chrislyn and the family as they recover from this illness of COVID and he proceeds onward with his treatments. And God, we pray for all of those anywhere right now that are suffering. That young lady named Candace that we know about, not that she's still in the hospital, but that she gets her life back together. God, so many people have so few people in their lives. Give us the opportunity to be the heart and hands and feet of Jesus in everything we do, in every place we go, so you can, so you can use us for work anytime anywhere. We pray all that in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now this is, uh, I know there's not many of us here, but this was Hawaiian shirt night, so uh, I'm pretty sure Joe wins. <laughs> it's between Joe and Leslie. I think Joe wins. Thank you. Y'all give Joe a hand. <laughs> See, you didn't know you were a winner when you walked in. You're a winner. Everybody's a winner. Uh, so the next songs we're singing are... Uh... Oh, I've got it written right down here. This is a really... This, this used to be a new one. 
<laughs> but it's an old as the deer many of you remember that from it was on the radio back when i was about eight um, anyway we know it's amazing grace my chains are gone is next and then then as the deer yeah okay anyway we know amazing grace y'all stand as we sing together
good to dig out those old songs, especially when we need to help the <laughs> musicians play. So, uh, tonight we're gonna, I'm going to read from Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Woe to the shepherds. You can turn me down just a little bit, honey. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doing, says the Lord. That I myself would gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David's righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. You know, one of the things when you read the Old Testament, whatever version you're reading, if you get the opportunity to notice if Lord is ever written in all caps, that means Yahweh. And in the, the ancients, they didn't say God's name. God was so revered that they didn't want to say God's name. And so they wrote it in a way that had no vowels, so it couldn't be pronounced. We would look at that and call it Yahweh. And so sometimes when you read through the Old Testament, you start to see Lord capitalized. It's different than, than other things. What they're saying there, this is that unknowable, unspeakable, un omnipresent, that one we sing about that's indescribable and unsearchable God. And so this particular passage reminds me, uh, I entitled this message, It's You. And, and so what I meant by that is directly, if the church is less popular than it used to be, it's you, in other words, it's us that caused that. If we're not making as much difference in the community as we could, it's us that causes that. We can't blame it on anybody else. Now, people would like to. They'd say, well, you know, we used to not be able to, you remember blue laws. We couldn't do anything on Sunday, so there was nothing else to do. People went to church. Now, I don't think that's why people went to church. I think they went to church because they wanted to be closer to God. I think that was a thing in the earlier times. I think that's less of a thing today. And I think that's concerning. That's something we should be concerned about, I think. It's interesting, though, that, that uh, there, there was a big paper that came out this week that it, for the first time in a long time, mainline Christians are now outnumbering evangelicals. I think that's, a, that's an interesting number. And, and really, the reason I think for that is that uh, I had a, one of my teachers, one of my mentor pastors, used to talk about it a lot. There's a certain amount of church that, that you expect it to be fun and vibrant and exciting. That's about the production part. And that's true. And sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, the music just gets you or the prayer gets you. Or maybe sometimes the sermon gets you. But it's an experience. Worship is. And I think more and more people are now, at least in, in current times, are realizing that the duties of Christianity are not to be in worship. It's what we do when we leave here. It's what we do the rest of the time. That, like the song says, we work for God. We play for God. We sing for God. And so when we start to realize it's, it's the, the things that we do as a Christian community that change the world, not any one worship service, really. I think uh, years ago, uh, our bishop before this bishop said, you need to preach a sermon on why the world needs a Methodist church. Well, it doesn't, and I wouldn't. The world needs a Christian church. And, you know, us Methodists are part of that. But that doesn't mean we're the end all of all. But now we've done some cool stuff. I mean, there's a little hospital down there at the med center 
that started out by our conference, the Texas conference started in years ago, that makes a huge difference in the world. You know, Houston Methodist Hospital is a megapolis of hospitalizations. Now one of the leading places in the world. Every time you go in there, it's one of the best places to work anywhere. So something's going on there. People are being saved. Uh, you know, Southern Methodist University, uh, you know, we're educating people. Everybody that goes there is not a Methodist. That may shock you. They sell beer in the dormitories. You know, <laughs> that shocked some people when I went to school there. You know, but uh, they don't, it's not that they're doing it for others, for the world, for the, for the difference it makes. So they have a law school and a seminary and a business school and an art school. And so you start to look around at what difference does it make? What are we doing to support the kingdom? I was coming in the hall today and evidently somebody brought a bunch of food. Y'all probably saw it if you came in that hallway. I have no idea who it was, but thank you. And we will keep it out there for the, but as I went out to get the coffee filters, which were in my car, there was a lady at the food pantry getting food. And she stopped and told me how much she appreciated, how grateful she was. I think that's the kind of stuff that's as important, if not more important, than what we actually do when we're in worship. Now, worship is a thing that sometimes attracts people. The truth is, we almost always meet people for the first time in worship. We very seldom meet somebody for the first time filling up the food box or other places. Sometimes we do at camp, though. You know, when we go there, we meet them for the first time. But this scripture kind of, kind of, I don't know, it kind of, Maybe because I, my job says I'm a shepherd. And if people are no longer coming, if people aren't getting closer to God, that would be partly my fault. And so I've got to figure out how I'm supposed to be this, this person that attracts people, that watches over people, that takes care of people. But i got to tell you, don't put it all on me. Because we're all shepherds. When we accepted the call to be Christian, we became shepherds. So Y'all all have the same authority I do. And so... When we have the opportunity, that's the reason I was so engaged by the, the book on the fish philosophy. Because the, it's, it's not a, it isn't a rule book on how we can do better in the kingdom. It's how can we make this work in a way that maybe makes us different than every other church. Not that they're bad. I'm talking just different. Right? I mean, you don't want to go see the same movie every week. Uh, you know, what could make us different? And so I think the, the first thing is, is it is an attitude, and I'm, I'm kind of going back to my whole deal I used to do. How are you all tonight? Joyful. Yeah, if we work on that, that's a good way to start. And how, what's our attitude? Joyful. We're joyful. And, and then if we realize that, that we also get to be a little bit playful, so whether that's wearing uh, Hawaiian shirts or telling jokes, did anybody have a good joke this week? <laughs> I heard some good ones, but... Uh, some of them I can't tell here. I did tell one that was funny, but I, I really can't tell. Uh, maybe I'll tell it after I turn the video off. It's not inappropriate. It's just I don't want to put it up in the world. It'd be fine for the family. But I think that's important. But then the part about being present really gets to me. What does that mean? I mean, we promised that when we join a church. You know, we'll be there with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. What does that mean? And, and we get it down. Oh, it means they want our offering. Well, sure, that's true. But And it means we want you to just be here. Well, that's true, too. But what is it really like to really be somewhere? I was with a, some people on Thursday evening. One of the ladies there is going through some chemotherapy. I said, how are you? She said, fine. I told her what I think fine stands for. And she said, yeah, that fits it more appropriately. I said, when I ask you how you are, I really want to know. Now, maybe we don't have time to discuss it right now, but I want you to know that I care. I want to, if, if you need to sit down and talk, I want to do that. And she said, well, you know that, nobody ever asks for that. You know, you walk past people in the hall, you say, how are you? You expect them to say, fine, and walk on past. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to care. To really care how people are. That's how we get to know people. It doesn't mean, this is something I learned in, in AA, but you, you don't have to try to fix them. You don't even have to try to solve all their problems. But just listen. Care. 
care enough to know what's going on. I think that's what shepherding is about. It's not necessarily, I mean, what does the shepherd really do? You know, the 23rd Psalm, right? He leads them before still waters and he does all that other stuff. But what does a shepherd really do? He just makes sure they're okay. He doesn't go out there and say, we're today we're going to walk five miles. He doesn't have an agenda. He simply goes out there to care for them. And the world is full of sheep. I'm really sure Jesus intentionally used that word. And as I've grown older, I found out sheep really are pretty dumb. And I think he means that about us too. I don't think that I don't think he's lightening up on us. I think he thinks we need a lot of shepherding. All of us. Because left to our own resources, we don't do a very good job of it. Yeah. And so we need somebody to model it, somebody to show us, and somebody to once in a while nudge us and say, Are you being a good shepherd? And I think that's what Jeremiah's doing here. I think he's reminding the people that God provided for you. And now it is your task to provide for others. And that fits the fish philosophy. And at the end of it, it says, make somebody's day. I think that's my new deal now, is how can I get up in the morning and make somebody's day? Somebody else's besides mine. There's enough of that going around. Amen. All, of us, all of us that ever went to an AA meeting know about making our own day. That's our whole agenda. But, but, and I don't think that's that different for other people either. I think that's just who we are as human beings. Maybe that's what original sin is. But for us to get outside of ourselves and say, how can I make somebody else's day? And, and I don't know who that would be, but I guarantee you there'll be somebody you'll get a chance to see t today. A guy pulled up in front of our house. He asked, he was very polite. He said, we're doing some work across the street. May I park my car next to your drive, your yard? And of course, Kathy was generous and she said, sure. Well, he's parked the wrong way on the road. It mostly irritates me that nobody really ever cares about it much. It just, if, you, if he were to have a wreck, if somebody hit him, it would be his fault because he's on the wrong side of the road. And so as he went around there, I said, hey, pal, let me just tell you, sometimes the police do come by. And if they do, you could get a ticket for parking on the wrong side of the road. And he said, well, what do you think if I unload my trailer and then turn my truck around? Well, so... I think I was trying to make somebody's day. I was trying to keep him out of trouble. I was trying to be generous and safety and kind. The, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know how you, it's not a formula. I don't know what y'all are going to do to make somebody's day. But that needs to be our intent. That needs to be our desire as we get up in the morning and we go out. How can I make somebody else's day today? And sometimes you don't have to go far. I mean, it could happen in your driveway, or it might happen at the grocery store. After, after I, I used the example last week, I don't know if I did on Saturday night or Sunday, of the, the checkers at the grocery store. I mean, can you think of a more monotonous, boring job just to slide stuff across the scanner all day long? And you know, you, if you ever get to see that, I'm sure you do if you go to the grocery store, there'll be a nice, sweet little lady with a million coupons. <laughs> And she'll be up there in the front, and she one of the coupons didn't ring up right, and she'll just be giving that checker heck. And if you see it, like at Kroger, they have a bell you can ring if you got good service, you know. Bring the fire out of that bell when you leave, because somebody's got to reward that lady. She's taking it right on the chin, man. It's not her fault if the thing doesn't scan right. And I mean, the same thing is true, you know, sometimes a bunch of us sometimes go eat after church. Sometimes 13 or 14 or 15 of us, sometimes they get the orders screwed up a little bit. The bigger the group, the more likely that is happening. You know, it, it, uh, I've been with people that threw their salad across the table and said, you know, I don't want anything. They, no, we got a chance to say, it's okay. You know, and so I, I, that's, that's what I think I'm getting out of this deal. How do we do what Jeremiah says is we take it upon ourselves to be shepherds of the lost. Shepherds of the ones that don't know the shepherd. And they may have to get to know you before they get to know that shepherd. And if you do a good enough job, they'll want to know that shepherd. But it may take more, more than once. It may take more than you. You know, I know uh, when you have the opportunity to run into people time and time again, you don't always know what their needs are or how you can make their day. 
But I know this, that a smile and a handshake or a fist bump can go a long ways. And to tell people that God loves them and that God cares about them and that you know that's true because God loves and cares about you. And I think those are the things that I get out of this passage. It's not all that complicated, but I did take a little affront to it at first when it says, if everything is going wrong, it's your fault. So when people say, well, there's not as many people going to church as there used to be, that's true. Whose fault is it? It's probably ours. There are probably people in every one of our lives right now that we could invite or say, and I'm not saying to necessarily come to this church, but encourage them to be a part of a faith community that with your encouragement they might. And then there's always going to be those people that are doubters. What does Jesus say to do about them? Remember what he says? Yeah, he says, go and administer and minister to them as long as they receive you. And if they don't, wipe the dust off your sandals and move on. We can't save them all. He can, and he'll use who's necessary to do it, but it just might not be you or me. It might be somebody else's task to do that. But I do know that it's important for them to hear it the first time. I, I know I've told this story before, but for nine years I've worked in psychiatric hospitals, much of that time doing assessments and uh, interventions. And uh, a number of times I listened to a guy's girl person's story, and at the end of the story he said, yeah, you probably got either a drug or an alcohol or some kind of problem. And they were in denial, and they left. Happened a lot. And once in a while, I'd get a phone call later and then said, you were right. And that was the thing that got them first to think it. So that same thing happens with this whole story about God is don't think that we're going to necessarily see the fruit. Although he does say that if we follow this recipe, we will be fruitful. If we follow this recipe, we'll be fruitful. But it doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily get to see all the fruit. And so we also need to remember that a big portion of the task that gets to be done in saving people is God's. We're the vessels. We're the people that go out and do the work. But we may not be rewarded to get to see the result. And so therefore we shouldn't decide to do it based on our result. In other words, we don't do the pumpkin patch. We don't quit doing the pumpkin patch because we don't get any church members out of it. We don't quit giving money to Bill Nash's Champions Kids Camp because none of those 200 kids come to church here. I mean, there, our, our result isn't important. What we do for the kingdom is what's important. And that's why I say the world doesn't necessarily need the Methodist church. It needs the Christian church to step up and do what it's been called to do. And us Methodists have our fair share of that to do. And we do some. It's not enough. If we churches did what we're really called by God to do, we wouldn't need governmental welfare. We wouldn't need a whole lot of handouts that have to happen from the government because the churches would be shepherding the people. Amen. And I think that's where we have to go. How do you do that? You make somebody's day. Maybe giving them canned beans and pancake mix makes their day, and if it does, we're doing our job. Maybe a handshake. Maybe a fist bump. I don't think it's all about money. It's not all about physical stuff. I think there's a big emotional component to this too. And I can just tell you there's a lot of people that don't feel very loved. And we have a chance to love them. It doesn't mean you have to take them home with you. <laughs> it doesn't mean you have to support them financially. I'm just saying we need to tell them they're loved. And they're loved by God and because God loves us and Jesus died for us, we love them too. So that's my summer message about make somebody else's day and how to fit all this together. I, I, uh, I can't read it any other way. If there's a problem with what's going on in the Christian church, it's the Christian church's fault. And the Christian church has an opportunity right now to relook at it because of the pandemic. Uh, to decide what we're going to be now. Because we don't necessarily have to go back the way it was. I mean, really. How many of us want to go back to the, the good old days when we didn't have air conditioning? Any takers? No. You know, everything always can be improved. And so I think, you know, sometimes when, 
you know, you're baking a cake and it falls on the floor and you, you got to start over. That's kind of where the church is. It's reinvented itself now for 2,000 years. There's some perfect opportunity for us now to become what Jesus needs this church to be for such a time as this in such a place as this. And that's my prayer, that we'll figure out how to do that. And my suggestion is start off, but let's make somebody stay every day. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship and to be in a free country. And it is the greatest country in the world, and we know that, and you pay a big part of that. But God, we also know we can be better. We can be less self-centered and more aware. We can pay attention to the greatest gift of all that Jesus died for us. And we can be willing to serve and give our lives for others. So today as we come to your table, make for us this bread and this cup, become for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we take this little piece of bread and drink this grape juice, we once again get Jesus in us to reinforce us, to strengthen us, and to send us in the world to be ministers of the gospel, of the kingdom, in all the things we do. As Jesus died to make our day, let us live to make others have their day. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Leslie, you won't come first. <clears throat> I am so grateful to Leslie for helping us out tonight. Y'all give me a hand. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, you'd have been having me sing so long. So low you couldn't hear me. <laughs> Friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place. We're having an earth meet. We are done giving money to Bill Nash. So the bucket now, if you have some spare change, goes very simply goes just to missions. Whatever missions that we'll be trying to get going in the future. Oh, there's no trash cans. Thank you, Leslie. Hang on. Oh, I got this one. It matches. <laughs> so the table is prepared. Come to this place. And everyone's invited to come, even if you've never been before.
Thank you, brother.